This video has been developed as an educational resource to illustrate best practices on how to evaluate images for alteration and aberrations to benefit the wider research community and in particular academic journal editors. This video has been created by an independent consultant under the auspices of STM and is an output from the STM Working Group on Image Alteration and Duplication Detection. This video is not an endorsement by any publisher or STM of the sufficiency and effectiveness of the illustrated steps for all cases of image aberration. STM, a global association of scientific, technical, and medical publishers, convened members experienced in research integrity to provide a community response to the escalating issue of image aberrations in scientific papers. Journals are the last checkpoint before findings enter the scientific record. Mistakes and misinformation mislead other researchers, seriously undermine scientific progress and waste public funds. The exponential growth of digital data and the ease of image processing tools have led to an unprecedented number of image aberrations. While image aberrations have been known for decades, in fact far predating digital data processing, journals have struggled individually to correct the large number of issues found in published papers in a consistent and efficient manner, let alone to ensure such problems are detected before publication. To give one example of the scale of the problem in my own field, molecular cell biology and biomedicine, we and colleagues at other journals have consistently over the last decade detected image aberrations in more than one in five research manuscripts that are otherwise ready for publication. This is based on manual screening, which at best uncovers only fairly obvious issues. Other academic domains report similar problems. We believe a number of reasons conspire to explain this prevalent issue. The rates of data produced has exploded. Publications are the single defining academic output that decides on funding and career. In some areas, there's intense competition to be the first to report a finding, exacerbated by competition for limited funding. A rapid turnover of academic staff leads to educational deficits. And finally, image processing is deceptively easy thanks to ubiquitous tools such as Photoshop. Crucially, while many problems are uncovered, the vast majority are down to mistakes or unscientific image processing. One motive in biology appears to be a desire to present clearer data, very much in an ill-advised concept that we sometimes call beautification. Nonetheless, in many cases, authentic underlying data does exist and the issue can be rectified if uncovered before publication. However, journal editors need to be clear when issues point to malintent and in rare cases outright forgery. In a clear classification, of the uncovered issues and an escalation process that is built on the presumption of innocence until proven guilty is essential. Furthermore, digital data tools are needed to more efficiently detect image aberrations in pre-publication and to provide objective analytics to help editors separate real issues from false positives. This is where the STM working group comes in. This expert group represents the first formal cross-industry initiative to act specifically on image integrity at the journal level. The committee has decided to prioritize three goals, tools, policy and process guidance, and training. Thus, the group is releasing spe specifications for standardized image forensic tools to further their development. It is issuing standard guidance for characterizing and processing different severities of image aberration in research papers. This includes an escalation process that prioritizes the integrity of the scientific record and, where possible, the resolution of problems through constructive interaction with researchers and their institutions. A straightforward three-tier framework is recommended that allows efficient resolution of mistakes and cosmetic issues directly with the authors. But also, where indicated, a due diligence assessment involving research institutions in, a, in more severe cases where data beautification affects the scientific conclusions. And finally, decisive action in cases of fraud, fraud. We have applied this process successfully for some years and look forward to a more consistent approach across the publishing industry. Finally, we aim to raise awareness and train publishers and editors about image integrity. Indeed, this first video is designed to provide you with a hands-on look at how to detect the different types of image aberrations typically seen in the scientific literature. A basic set of image forensic techniques is introduced by my colleague Jana Christopher, 
who frames examples using the classification process described. We hope you find these videos useful in setting up your own image integrity screening process and welcome your suggestions and feedback. We can only tackle this issue by cooperating across publishers with researchers, academic institutions and funders. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jana Christopher. I'm a data integrity analyst and I've been working over many years for a variety of journals and publishers, screening images pre-publication and also assisting in the investigation of published material. This tutorial was created to introduce editors and editorial staff to some principles of image integrity screening. It will give you some basic tools for spotting potential problems and show options to possibly verify any suspicions you may have. This first module will give an introduction to the subject of image alteration and duplication in scientific publications. The term alteration is used in this tutorial to refer to image processing that alters scientific data in ways that are at odds with good scientific practice. The examples shown are mainly from the life sciences, but you will see that the screening techniques introduced are equally applicable to images from other disciplines. This tutorial consists of four modules. Over the course of these modules, we will go over several examples of image alteration and introduce some basic screening techniques using a variety of image processing software. We will show basic screening in preview and more comprehensive techniques in Photoshop. The aim of this first module is to introduce a range of the most common types of alterations and to give an idea of what to look out for across a variety of image categories. The subsequent three modules cover various image categories frequently encountered and screening techniques for each image type. We will start with introducing the most common types of image aberrations. These are splicing, cloning, erasing, Duplications, and these include straight duplicates, part duplicates, and duplicates with alterations, such as rotating, flipping, stretching, and resizing, and also over-contrasting and cropping. The first issue we repeatedly come across is splicing, insertion, and dropping in of elements. In western blots you may detect vertical or horizontal hard straight lines where the background appears interrupted. These are generally digital cuts that have been performed either to remove a section of an image and joining it back together or to move and add a section to an image that wasn't initially there. In this solarized image, and we will show what this is and how to solarize an image in the next module, the morphological features, outlines and background texture become more visible and this makes it a lot easier to spot any cuts and splices. We need to look out for hard lines, sudden changes in background color or texture, as well as bands and elements that just don't sit right or don't seem to belong there. Sometimes edit sections are actual copies from elsewhere in the same blot or the same figure. In this image the cuts themselves are only vaguely detectable. However the same section seems to have been used three times. So it appears that this is not an original blot but an altered version. Another method of altering images that we observe fairly frequently is cloning. It entails replacing the information for one part of a picture with information from another part. The basic clone stamp tool is rather easy to use and the results are often very difficult to spot. This is a brief demonstration of how the clone tool works in action. In this western blot image, one of the stronger bands from the row at the bottom is to cover or replace the weaker signal in the image at the top. So the clone tool would be used to mark and pick up this area here to then paste it over and replace a much fainter band in the western blot at the top. You can see that this is relatively easy to do and including the surrounding area like this smudge would help the darker band to sit quite nicely among the others there. And of course it is also possible to pick up a bit of empty background and simply clone it over an area like this and thereby effectively remove a band. Cloning is generally only detectable if the cloned area comes from elsewhere within the same image, so that we can spot a duplication.
This problem of small elements repeating may also be found in other types of images, such as histograms and scatter plots. In this example, a small constellation of dots in the top left quadrant appears several times. When small areas or elements repeat throughout an image, this could also indicate that specific areas in the image were replaced in order to hide or, in effect, remove elements. Most graphic software now offers a tool for this. In Photoshop it is called Content-Aware Fill. It uses information from the surrounding areas to replace information in a selected region of an image. We will talk about this more in Module 3. Erasing areas is possible in Photoshop using various tools, such as the Brush tool or the Eraser tool, which basically erases pixels as it is dragged across the image. The pixels can either be erased to transparency or the background colour if the layer is locked. This is sometimes also used to obscure areas of an image or to clean up, removing debris or small bright signals in order to produce an even, clean background while making the fluorescent elements stand out more clearly. Often just changing contrast and brightness of an image will reveal the traces of the eraser tool. The next chapter is all about duplications. Here we will cover three types, the first type being straight duplications. This describes a simple one-to-one -one duplication of an image, like in this example. This type of duplication may accidentally happen due to a copy and paste error, in which case the duplicates may be located in the same figure and close by. You might also find duplicates across two figures, like in this case. These two plots in two different figures are labelled differently and represent two separate experiments. The different colours are distracting, but if we overlay the two images we find that all the data points match exactly. It is important to compare same type images across all figures and to check for duplications carefully. Next up are duplications with repositioning where two or more different sections of the same image are shown in separate panels, sometimes to represent different experiments or conditions. So in one of the panels, the image is shifted within the frame and there is only a partial overlap. To verify a duplication, each of the two images can be pasted into separate colour channels. When the two channels are overlaid, all the areas that are identical will show up as yellow and black or grey, and everything that still shows up as red or green is unique and doesn't match. The process of overlaying two images will be demonstrated again and explained in more detail in the subsequent modules. The third category covers duplications where one of the two images has been altered. These alterations may include any of the following resizing, rotating, flipping, stretching, changing colours and sometimes adding or removing elements. Duplications with alterations are harder to spot. Sometimes it can be really tricky, but you can train your eyes. The more examples you've seen, the easier it will become. Take a look at these two panels in the next example. There is a repeating pattern. Focus on this formation of three cells. The image on the left has a lower magnification and you'll notice that the orientation is different as well. We we'll start by flipping one image horizontally and then rotate it by 90 degrees to replicate position of the other. We can then resize and move the panel over the top of the other and if we now switch the overlaid image on and off we can see clearly that the two are identical. The next example shows a rotated duplication where some elements have been added or removed. At first glance these two microscopy images may not look very similar to each other, but you may notice this constellation of a large and two smaller elements in both of them. When we rotate one of the panels by 180 degrees, you'll notice that the two are in fact quite similar. The panels show slightly different sections of the same image, marked here in blue. 
you can see the similarities, but some elements appear to have been removed. When we overlay the images, we find that they match almost perfectly. However, there are some small areas that show up as red. These are the regions that have been altered. Duplications and part duplications are not limited to micrographs and biological images, but may also occur in graphs, plots and spectra. At close inspection of this histogram, we can detect several repetitions in the signal, marked here with purple arrows. Sometimes we find that a duplicated element has been stretched. In this example, the red histogram appears to be a stretched version of the blue one. In order to verify this, we can use Photoshop to copy the blue curve and paste it back into the image on a separate layer and at a lower opacity. We can then move this layer over the red curve and stretch it vertically. You can now see that all the peaks match perfectly. Stretch duplications are of course also found among microscopy images. In this example, the right-hand panel in the middle row shows a stretched version of the image to the left. If we resize the image and then reverse the stretching, the duplicates are clearly evident. When screening for repeating elements across micrographs or western blot images, we need to be very careful. Two features can look very similar at first glance and turn out to be different. Processes like solarizing the images to reveal outlines and background features, as well as overlay techniques, can be useful to help verify potential duplicates. Some cases may be ambiguous, as actual duplicates may not necessarily be pixel by pixel identical. This may be due to differences in resolution, compression, or because they have been processed in different ways. In these cases, it may help to ask the author for higher resolution images. We might also need to consider the areas surrounding the potentially duplicated details and to gauge the likelihood of a distinct shape to reappear once or even numerous times in the same or across images. In this example, the two marked bands are not pixel identical, but given the distinct and quite complex outline of the bands, the principle of too similar to be different applies. Some other problems that we repeatedly encounter are for example non-matching insets and scale bars. In figures showing close-up panels, the enlarged section that is depicted in the inset should ideally be clearly marked in the corresponding panel, as seen in this example. However, we can see here that the panels for the magnified image do not match the section indicated. Sometimes the selection is just marked wrongly, and in some cases the images may not correspond at all. Also remember scale bars. These are sometimes incorrect or even missing altogether. Do watch out for that. Another important issue is contrast settings. If done in moderation, a slight adjustment of the brightness and contrast settings is acceptable. However, remember that linear adjustments must be applied equally to the entire image. It is important that the background and any fainter signals remain visible. Western blot images where any data, even if it's just background noise, are effectively wiped out so that the image has large monochrome areas without noise are not acceptable. When we increase the contrast in this western blot image, some of the weaker signals, like fainter bands, may simply disappear. The image with the original contrast setting is shown at the top. Partial or non-linear adjustments and unequal application of brightness, contrast, intensity, color, etc. are not acceptable practice. Remember that over-contrasting can also help to obscure splice lines and other alterations, so if you encounter an image with a wiped out background, you should always flag this up. 
Also watch out for very tight cropping. There should be ample space above and below the bands or object of interest. Ensure that elements that might disagree with the hypothesis proposed in the study have not been cropped out. A note on the processing of images that are directly compared to each other. To allow an accurate comparison of images, these should be acquired with identical settings, and any processing should also be identical. The contrast in the two marked up panels here is now increased, which means the signals appear much stronger in relation to the other panels, so this would not be a true representation of what was observed in the experiment. Publishers sometimes receive images with very low resolution. Although the figure as a whole may have a resolution of 300 dpi, individual panels might be affected by compression artifacts, which can make it very difficult to analyse an image. These typical blocky artifacts, as seen across this example, might resemble traces of data alteration such as splice marks. Elements can sometimes look like they were dropped or pasted in, although they are genuine as such, and the only problem is in fact the image quality. If you encounter these questions, it is advisable to request better quality images or the original data. The person who is screening the images will not necessarily be involved in the process of evaluating the severity of each issue and determining an overall categorization of level 1 to 3. Nonetheless, it is inevitable that you will wonder about the aim of altering and manipulating an image. What kind of alteration was performed? Was this potentially an accident or was it done deliberately? And if so, why did the authors presumably make that alteration? Was it to beautify the image, to make an image clearer or to emphasize results? Was it to hide something deliberately and if so, what was hidden? Or was it to fabricate an image and in effect claim a result that was not factually observed? As you recognize the purpose of an alteration and note the technical level and skill involved, the answers might help you to anticipate further alterations across the same manuscript. This job can be a little bit like detective work, which of course keeps it interesting. But remember to stick to what you can see and prove. There is no room for speculation or guesswork. Judging intent and motives requires interaction with the authors and often with the relevant research institutions. Many adjustments to visual data are made with an intent to beautify the image, i.e. to present clear-cut, selected or simplified data rather than to falsify. This is important to remember. The line between beautification and fabrication can be incredibly difficult to call and it is often impossible for journals to solve this alone. The presumption of the innocence principle is absolutely essential. It is also often critical to see the raw data, which might help understand what happened and why.